Today we'll talk about object relational mapping using Java Persistence API and a very popular Java OM library called Hibernate. Let's start with the object-oriented paradigm we learned in our programming classes. It basically says that our world consists of objects like desks and chairs and so on. So object-oriented programming languages like Java are good because it can be used to model the real world more closely and more easily. After using all languages for a while, most of us probably would agree that this is indeed the case. To continue with this line of thought, we think that for data storage, we want to use object-oriented databases too. So if there are some objects in our program that we want to save, we can save them directly in a database, just like saving them in memory. The problem, however, is that despite lots of efforts spent on the research and development of object-oriented databases, relational databases are still the most efficient, most reliable, and the most widely supported database systems these days. What this means is that there's often this mismatch between our applications, which are usually written in object-oriented languages, and our data storage, which is usually relational. There are two ways to bridge this gap, core-level interface and embedded SQL, which we studied in other classes, and object relational mapping, which we'll discuss in this lesson. Most of you are familiar with core-level interface, where an application interacts with a database through function or method calls. The way it works is that the application creates an SQL statement in the form of a string, and this string is passed to a method as a parameter. The method then th sends the string to the database, which runs it as an SQL statement. The results of the statement are then sent back from the database, and the method returns the results as a return value. The example shown here is in Java and in other languages is pretty much the same. Another way to access a database is to embed SQL directly in the program. The example shown here is embedded SQL for Java. An important advantage of embedded SQL is that SQL statements are recognized as special statements instead of as regular strings. So it's possible to detect SQL syntax errors during compilation rather than waiting for runtime errors. The downside, however, is that we cannot use a regular Java compiler to compile this code because it's not Java anymore. We'll need to first use a pre-compiler to convert this code into regular Java code and then use a regular Java compiler to compile it. This additional requirement of tool support is probably why embedded SQL is not nearly as popular as CLI. Regardless, know that in both CLI and in, in, and in embedded SQL, it's the application developer's responsibility to convert between application objects and the database rows and columns. And this could lead to some problems as shown in our next example. Here, I have a Java class that represents employees. An employee has an ID, a name, and a supervisor. A supervisor is an employee, him or herself, and uh, notice that the supervisor field is of the type employee. And this is a pretty standard object-oriented de class design. And here's the database table design if we want to store the employee information in a relational database. The table has three, three columns, ID, name, and the supervisor ID. Comparing this with the Java class, we can see that the supervisor here is of employee type in the class, but here the supervisor ID is a integer field storing the supervisor's ID. And this, of course, is because there's no class type in relational model. However, 
with in supervisor ID, we can use it to find a supervisor. You can we can use a supervisor ID to find the supervisor record, and uh, it actually works in pretty much the same way as in this OO design. Because notice that this supervisor field is actually a reference to the actual supervisor object, just like this supervisor ID is can be used as a reference to find the actual supervisor record. And uh, again, this is a pretty good and a pretty standard uh, relational design. So, so far so good, right? The problem is simple and we have a good solid designs on both sides. You think that there won't be any problem. Well, turns out that it's not quite the case. Considering this example, suppose we want to write a constructor for the, for the employee class. This constructor takes an employee ID as a parameter, use the ID to query the database and construct an in employee object based on the results. The code would look something like this. The first thing we notice is that SQL is hard-coded into the application. Because each DBMS has, it, has its own SQL dialect, if we want to switch to a different DBMS, this could become a problem because we'll have to check and potentially change lots of Java code. With that being said, switching DBMS really doesn't happen all that often. So although hard coding SQL could potentially be a problem, it probably is not too big a deal. Here, however, is a bigger problem. After the query completes and the results sent back from the database, we have to manually convert rows and columns into objects. It doesn't look too bad in this example because our class only has three fields. In a more realistic example, like the user class in the CSNS2 project, like here. If we browse through this class, we can see that there are actually more than 30 fields in this single class. And if we have to do something like rsgetString, rsgetInt, and so on for each one of those fields, it gets quite tedious. But then again, we are software developers, and we are paid to write code. Even though sometimes it's tedious code, it's probably still not a deal breaker. But how about this problem? Here, notice that the supervisor field of the employee class is of employee type. But the supervisor ID in the employee's table is integer. So here, if we want to get the supervisor, and if we try to do a rs get int supervisor ID, we are going to get an error because of the type mismatch. This is an int and this is an employee type. So how do we do this? One creative solution somebody came up with is doing a recursive call like this. And this looks neat and actually kind of works as long as the recursion stops when we get to an employee who doesn't have a supervisor, presumably the CEO of the company. The problem of this is that although we just want one employee object, this will create a whole lot more objects, including not only the employee, but the employee's supervisor, the supervisor's supervisor, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the head of the company. And obviously, this is quite inefficient. So how do we deal with this? If you think about what you did when you use, for example, JDBC for database access, you'll realize that this is probably what you did when you are in a similar situation. Instead of designing your 
employee class like this. You probably designed your employee class like this. And uh, here lies the biggest problem caused by the paradigm mismatch between the application and the data storage. Namely, when you use a relational database for data storage, it forces you to design your data model classes to be like tables. Or in other words, although this is a class, it's based on a relational design rather than an object-oriented design. So we are losing the benefits of using an object-oriented language simply because we have to use a relational database for storage. So how do we solve the problem of the paradigm mismatch between our object-oriented application and the relational data storage? Well, this is where ORM comes in. It stands for Object Relational Mapping, and as the name suggests, it's a layer that sits between the application and the relational data storage, and it's responsible for translating between objects in the application and the rows and columns in the database. ORM is very popular these days, and many languages have their own ORM solutions. In Java, the mainstream ORM solution is JPA and Hibernate. JPA defines three things. A set of annotations used for mapping Java classes to relational tables, a data access API, kind of like JDBC, and the object-oriented query language, JPQL. It's like SQL, except that SQL works on tables and rows and columns, while JPQL works on classes and objects and uh, properties. JPA stands for Java Persistence API, and, uh, and as the name says, it's an API, which means it's an interface, not an implantation. Just like when you use JDB, JDBC, you need a JDBC driver. When you use JPA, you need a JD, JPA implantation. And that's where Hibernate comes in. Hibernate is the most popular Java ORM library. And in fact, it almost single-handedly popularized ORM in Java development. The development of Hibernate actually preceded the JPA standard. Thus, there are two ways to use Hibernate. You can use the native Hibernate API without using JPA, and this allows you to access some Hibernate features that are not available in JPA. The other way is to use Hibernate as a JPA implantation. The benefit of doing this is better portability in the sense that if you are not happy with Hibernate, you can replace it with another JPA implantation without changing your code. Another benefit is that the behaviors of the operations tend to be better defined and documented in JPA. So in this class, we take the second approach using both JPA and Hibernate. Let's see how it works with an example. This example only has a few files, a model class, some code that shows how to load an object, save an object, search an object, and so on, a configuration file that includes the database information, and a configuration file for the logging tool used by Hibernate. We'll ignore the logging configuration file for now, as it's not a required, required file, and also because we'll discuss logging in more details in another lesson. Let's first look at the data model class employee. As we can see, it's a pretty simple class with three fields and some getters and setters. This notice that is the same class that that's in our previous example. And note that the supervisor 
field here is of employee type, not an integer. In other words, this is a proper object-oriented design, not the design that maps to directly to a table. The employee class here is a very typical persistent persistent class. A persistent class simply means we want to save the objects of this class in a database. And those objects are called, of course, persistent objects. As we can see, a persistent class is really just a model class in an MVC application. With that being said, it's recommended that a persistent class meets some additional requirements. First, it should have an ID field, like this. If you know database design, you know that this field is the primary key field of the table this class is going to be mapped to. And uh, secondly, this class should implement the serializable interface here. There's no method in the serializable interface, so you don't need to write any additional code. Implementing the serializable interface simply means that the objects of this class can be converted to binary form and back. The main purpose of this requirement is to allow the object caching function in the ORM to to save the cached objects on disk when the memory cache is full. The last requirement is that all persistent fields, meaning the fields you want to save to database, must have getters and setters. Note that those getters and setters don't have to be public, so this requirement won't break the encapsulation design of the class. All in all, as we can see, it doesn't take much to make a typical model class a persistent class, as we usually do. As we usually do these things in a model class anyway. And not to mention that these requirements are recommended, not required. The takeaway here is that you can design your model classes as you see fit, and they can be used as persistent classes with little or no change. But, of course, there's no magic in software development. We do need to specify how this model class is mapped to a table. And this is where we use these annotations. Later, in the second part of the lesson, we'll talk more about the mapping annotations. But here are a few that are most commonly used. A persistent a persistent class needs to be annotated with the entity annotation. By default, the class will be mapped to a table with the same name, but I usually use different naming conventions for Java code and SQL. So here I use another annotation table to specify the table name. So I specify the table names to be employees with lowercase e instead of employee uh, with capital E as in the class name. And uh, ID, of course, is for the ID field. And uh, more often than not, you also want to use the generated value annotation. This one tells the database to use its default method to generate new unique IDs. For example, in MySQL, it will be auto-increment, and in PostgreSQL, it will use a so-called sequence to generate new IDs. Fields of simple types like numbers and strings can be annotated with basic, and uh, this annotation can be omitted as we did here. Class types like employee needs to be annotated with either many-to-one or one-to-many or many-to-many -many or one-to-one. -one. For example, here each employee has only one supervisor and the many employees may have the same supervisor. 
So the annotation here is many to one, many employees to one supervisor. All in all, as we can see, annotations are mostly pretty straightforward. And with these annotations, the ORM2 knows how this class is mapped to a database table. And uh, speaking of database table, I already created the table in the database. Here is the employees table. And if we do a select from employees, we can see that there are currently three records in the table. Note that Tom's supervisor is Joe, supervisor ID 2, Joe's ID is 2. And uh, Joe's supervisor is Sue, supervisor ID 1, Sue's ID is 1. And the Sue doesn't have a supervisor, so presumably Sue is the uh, uh, head of the company. So we have our model class, we have our annotations telling the OM to how this class is mapped to our database table. And then we need to specify the information about the database, whether it's a Postgres SQL database or MySQL database, database URL, username, password, and so on. This information is in a special file called persistence.xml. This file is required by JPA, and uh, its name must be persistence.xml, and uh, it has to be under a folder called metainf under the class path. So in a Maven project, the right place to put it is under source slash main slash resources and then metainf. As we can see here, in this file, we need to specify something called a persistence unit. And we have to specify a provider for this unit. Because we, because we are using Hibernate as our JPA implementation, the provider here is a Hibernate class. If you use a different JPA implementation, just replace this one with a class from that implementation. As for the properties, notice that some of these properties are standard JPA properties with the name Java X dot persistence dot something. And uh, these properties provide general information about the database, the, the URL, the database drive, JDBC driver, username and password. And then there are some properties that are specific to the provider that controls how that provider works. For example, hibernate.dialect. This property tells Hibernate that the underlying database is a Postgres SQL database. So Hibernate will generate SQL statements in Postgres's dialect. And uh, we also have a property called show SQL and currently is false. Later on, we'll change it to true and see the SQL statements generated by, by Hibernate. And one last thing before I see how the whole thing works. Remember that in JDBC, we use connection, statement, prepared statement, result set, and so on to access the database? Well. With JPA, we have a similar set of classes, interfaces, and methods for database access, except, of course, that the data is now accessed as objects instead of rows and columns. The most important interface is this one, Entity Manager. After class, Please have a look at the Entity Manager documentation to get an idea of the method it provides. Basically, all the database access will be done through these methods. Now, finally, let's get to our example code. So 
This piece of code will perform some database access of this table and uh, will load the object, will search for objects, will print out some information, and so on and so forth. So uh, the first thing, let's get some boilerplate code out of the way. As we can see, at the beginning, there are a couple of lines to initialize the entity manager. First, we create a so-called entity manager factory. And uh, because all the information is already specified in the persistence.xml file, we don't need to put much information in there, uh, in here. Here, all we need is the name of the persistent persistence unit. And uh, here it says hibernate dash examples. And here it says hibernate dash examples. And uh, that's enough. Once we create the entity manager factory, we create an entity manager from it. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, everything, uh, every database access in, uh, fun uh, method is in entity manager. And once we are done, we close uh, close the entity manager down, we close the entity manager factory down, and that's that. So uh, for us, the more interesting things happen in the middle of this code. So we start with something simple. Let's say that uh, we want to load an uh, employee from the from the database table. We'll say, uh, give me the employee whose ID is 3. And uh, that should be tongue. So here we see the first method of entity manager. And this method allows us to load an object from a database giving the primary key of the object. So we know that the primary key is ID, or in other words, the ID field. And uh, so we can use a method called find. Find specifies a class, specifies the value of the primary key, and uh, it returns a object directly. And if we run this code, let's run this code. You can see that it prints out town, which is uh, exactly what we would expect. Now, uh, the first thing we notice here is that uh, unlike in JDBC, there's no code necessary to convert the result set into an object. So we don't have to do get string, get int, or anything like that. And those conversions are automatically done behind the scene by the ORM2 because the ORM2 knows how to convert between columns and the fields. We already did the mapping here. Right? So uh, that makes database access uh, quite a bit simpler. Now, that's not even the most interesting part. So let's say that uh, we want to print out employee number three supervisor's name. If you look at the database table, this is employee number three, and the employee the supervisor's name is in a different row, right? In other words, this employee number three's record only has the supervisor's ID. So if you remember your SQL, you will know that in order to get the supervisor's name, which is Joe, you actually have to do something called a self-drawing of this table. And then you can get Joe's name from Joe's ID. However, here, we don't have to do that. We can simply say system.printout and the uh, print line. And we can say get supervisor get name. And uh, that's it. We get the name Joe. Notice that uh, not only we don't have to do a self-drawing, we don't have to do any query at all. All we need to do is just call get supervisor, get name, just like regular Java, and that's it. And uh, this shows you the 
power of good object oriented design. Imagine that if instead of employee, you say integer employee uh, supervisor ID here, then what you would have to do is you have to do another query to get the supervisor's object and then you do supervisor.getName, right? But with good OO design, we can take advantage of the fact that this field is an employee type and the employee type, well, uh, have its own method, own properties and so on. So instead of uh, having to write additional queries, we can simply treat it as a regular project and uh, call getters and uh, setters and uh, references and so on. And uh, similarly, if we want to get, let's say, employee number three's supervisor, supervisor, well, we can simply say get supervisor. Well, supervisor has another supervisor, and uh, let's get uh, that person's name. And uh, we got Sue here. Again, if you remember your SQL, you will know that with SQL or with a, a CLI like JDBC, you would have to do two self-joins in order to get Sue's name. But here it becomes just like a simple regular Java. So what's going on behind the scene? Well, Let's do this again, but uh, this time we'll set show SQL to true. So as we can see here, it's not like we are not uh, using SQL. It's just that uh, we no longer have to write SQL ourselves. We can just call object methods and the behind the scene. The ORM tool will automatically generate SQL queries for us. So this makes data access a lot more convenient than, SQ than using SQL or JDBC or any CLI because lots of times you no longer have to write queries directly. All you need to do is get an object and then use that ob object to get other objects and behind the scene, your RM2 will do a lot of, lot of difficult work for you. Okay, so let's do an update. We know how to do a simple query now, and uh, let's say now I want to create a new employee and uh, I want to save that employee to the database. So just like a regular Java, if we want to create a new object, we create a new object. We'll say new employee, and uh, this new employee is an employee, and the uh, new employee name, let's say new employee is called John, and uh, New employee's supervisor. Let's say this one is supervised by employee number three, which is Tom. And uh, then we need to save it to the database. Well, the way to save it database is something like this. We'll say entity manager get transaction begin and then we'll say entity manager persist and then we'll say entity manager get transaction commit okay so let's run this and make sure it works first Yep. As we can see, Hibernate actually generated an insert statement for us. 
and uh, if we go back to the database and do a select, we can see that now we have a new record in the table for John, and uh, John's ID is 100, and John's supervisor's ID is 3, which means John's supervisor is Tom. So there are a couple of things worth mentioning here. Well, uh, let's say three things. First, notice that we have to do a transaction begin and transaction commit, unlike uh, when we load a employee object from the database. When we do a database update, which means that uh, when we uh, do something equivalent to a insert statement or update statement or delete statement, Hibernate requires that, that uh, to enclose those statements, those update statements in, in a transaction. Transaction is something that you learn in a database class or uh, when you study JDBC, so I'm not going to get into uh, what is a transaction. The short version here is that if you want to put something into a database, whether it's a new, new object or whether it's uh, some changes to an existing object, you have to uh, put those statements inside a transaction. The second thing <coughs> to note is that uh, just like when we load an object from the database, in our application code, we simply save an object as an object. Once again, the ORM tool will generate the proper SQL statements for us. And uh, in the application code, we simply treat object as object. We say save object, and that's that. Now, the third thing is that uh, there are two methods we can typically use to save objects. The first one is persist, and the second one is merge. So if we change that to merge, and if we go to the database, we can see that merge also saves a new record or new object into the database. It's still called John, but notice that the ID is different. Now, uh, so there's the question, what's the difference between persist and merge, and uh, which one uh, we should use? Well, here's a comparison between persist and merge, and uh, there are three scenarios. The first scenario is object passed was never persisted, and uh, this is basically this case where we want to save a new object. The second and third scenarios are objects was previously persisted but not loaded in this persistent context, and the object was previously persisted and already loaded in this persistence context. The most confusing term is probably persistence context. And the simple way to understand this is to think of it as a database connection. Let's look at this example, which is pretty common in web application development. Suppose we want to edit an object. So we first load the object from the database, probably in a do-get method. We save the object in session, and then in the do-post method, get the object from the session, make some changes according to the request parameters, and then save the object back to the database. Note that in this case, the object was loaded in one persistence context. Again, think of it as a database connection. And then the connection is closed and the persistence context is gone. At this point, this object is called a detached object. And later, if we try to save it back to the database in a different persistence context using persist, it's the second scenario described here, and we'll get an exception. So what's the conclusion here then? Well, uh, the conclusion, uh, in short, is that uh, uh, always use merge, because uh, merge is a more general way of uh, saving saving data. Uh, 
if you use persist and if you use persist to save new objects it usually works fine but uh, in uh, many other common scenarios persist will give you an error so might as well save yourself the headache and use merge uh, uh, always use merge now the problem with merge however is that it has a little quirk if we look at the if we look at the documentation we can see that persist takes only an object as a parameter and it doesn't have any return value which means that you are only dealing with one object and that's it merge on the other hand notice that it takes an object as parameter and it also returns an object so there are two objects involved the quirk of merge is that the returned object is the so-called managed object and what that means is that uh, you should always use the return object after you call a merge so here for example the proper way to do this is to assign the returned value of merge back to new employee so what does that mean or uh, what's the difference well uh, let's see this so suppose we don't do anything and after we merge the new employee we do a print and we print out employee get id notice that when we create this new employee object we didn't set an id for it instead we let the database to automatically generate a new id so after merging or after saving this object we would expect that this new employee get id would uh, show the new id for example 101 or 102 or something if we run this code however we notice that uh, it's still now in other words this new employee employee object is still the old object without the id but what if we actually want the the, the new employee that's being saved in the database which should have the id 102 well that's the objects that's the object returned by merge so if we assign the returned object back to employee and then we print it out let's try this and you can see that now we actually get the id of the new employee and what this tells us is that the, there are two objects involved when we call merge the one we pass to merge and the one merge returns and uh, after a merge you should always use the one returned by the merge uh, especially when you use merge to save a new object uh, the one that you pass to merge is still the original object without the id and uh, if you forgot this uh, oftentimes you end up with a null pointer error so uh, keep this in mind uh, merge is pretty easy to use just remember that it returns a value and you want to use the return value after merge okay so moving on let's do this part let's say we want to find all the employees who are currently supervised by employee number three or in other words we want to list all these jumps okay so just like uh, what we always do we are going to write a query and uh, this time however the query looks like this we'll say from employee where supervisor.id is something and then we'll say the results is 
entity manager create query this one is a query and this one is a class and then we'll say set parameter and we'll say parameter id is 3 and then we'll say get result list and uh, let's print out the names of those employees so we'll do for employee e in results and we print out those people's name e dot get name and uh, let's run this first okay so we got the subordinates of Tom which uh, I'll have the name drop <coughs> okay so uh, let's uh, quickly get the, the syntax and the methods out of the way and then we'll discuss the query itself so uh, what we are doing here is that we are creating a query with a parameter remember in JDBC we have prepared statement where we have uh, placeholders for parameters and uh, it's a uh, it's very similar here except that uh, now those placeholders uh, have their own names so here I'm creating a placeholder called ID and then later on I can set a value to replace this placeholder by its name <coughs> excuse me <coughs> And uh, <coughs> secondly, just like we've seen before, in using Entity Manager, we retrieve data as objects, uh, not uh, rows and columns. So what we do is we specify the class type of those objects. We are basically saying here that uh, uh, run this query and the returned results are of employee type and uh, this is why when we do get result list we're going to get a list of employee objects and the set parameter of course set a value to the parameter called id here so jpa and hibernate is designed in such a way that we can chain several methods together like this so we can write all of this in in one statement now <coughs> that part is clear and uh, let's take a look at this query and see what's going on and this is the, the query here in the interesting part so the most important thing about this query is that uh, this query is about classes and objects and properties not about tables and rows and columns notice that our table name is called employees lowercase e and uh, plural form right here we are not selecting from a table and uh, we are actually selecting from the employee class so what this query says is that we want to select all the objects in class employee where the property supervisors id is this given value and because it's selecting objects not columns the select class in sql can be omitted because in sql you need to specify the columns but uh, here we are getting all the columns of the objects so we don't need to specify that anymore and uh, of course the results are all objects and uh, no more uh, converting between result set uh, columns and rows into objects ourselves another thing to pay attention to is here because we are dealing with classes instead of tables the where class is using properties not columns anymore 
and the benefit of that is we can do something like supervisor.id or we can do something like supervisor.supervisor.id this is of course not something that you can do with uh, sql and the table columns because uh, table a uh, column is just a column but uh, in this query here is a property and the supervisor is an employee property which has its own supervisor uh, property which has its own id property and so on so because of that this where clause becomes much more uh, flexible and powerful this query is this is in this query language called java persistence query language or jpql I sometimes also call it HQL because we are using Hibernate's version of JPQL, which supports all JPQL syntax plus some more. As you can imagine, the statements written in JPQL or HQL are automatically translated into SQL by the OM2, and not only that, the OM2 is smart enough to translate them into different dialects of SQL depending on which database systems we are using. Because HQL is very similar to SQL, which everybody is supposed to be, which everybody is supposed to be familiar with, and also because we don't have enough time, uh, I'm not going to discuss HQL in details. Uh, please check out the please check out the documentation if you have questions about HQL and. Uh, here you can see lots of HQL examples, and uh, most of them are pretty straightforward. If uh, during, uh, if when you do your homework or project, and uh, you want to write a query that uh, you cannot uh, intuitively come up with, like a query like this, then uh, check out the documentation. Now, uh, with that said, I do want to show an example of doing join in HQL. Unlike in SQL, uh, most of the time in HQL or JP, JPQL, you actually don't need to do join, uh, as we'll see in this example. Uh, but once in a while, you do need to do a join, which is not hard to do, but I want to uh, just quickly show something uh, like that. OK, so here. I have two classes, one user class, ID username, and one section class, ID instructor. Section representing a class section, which has a section ID or number, and then uh, a user would be the instructor of that uh, class section. So the two tables corresponding to those two classes are like this, users table, ID username, sections table, ID instructor ID, and then uh, we can see from this table that uh, the class class section one uh, is taught by the user CY song, class section two also by CY song, and uh, class section three is taught by the user uh, Crespi. So here's our query. Let's say we want to find the sections taught by the user CY song. And uh, let me open up an editor. And uh, let's say this is a query we want to write. Find the sections taught by the user CY song. So how do we do this in SQL? Notice that the user's name is in the user's table and the section information is in the sections table. So we'll do something like this. We'll say select star dot uh, s dot star from sections s, s 
users view where s dot instructor id is u dot id and u dot username is say something like this. Notice that in order to complete this query, we have to do a two table drawing and then we select the information. Now, what if we want to do this, this in HQL or JPQL? Well, it's from section where instructor, notice that uh, this one is called instructor, which is a property in section. We'll say where instructor dot username is CYSOM. And that's it. If you compare these two queries, you can see that, as I mentioned, because of the way uh, where class is, uh, because we can use properties in where class in HQL, it makes queries a lot simpler in general because you can say property dot property dot property and so on. So in this particular example, uh, in SQL, we'll need to write a somewhat complex drawing query of two tables. But in HQL or JPQL, it's a simple selection query. And uh, the drawing part is actually implicitly included in property dot property. And uh, so this is an example of how uh, using HQL or JPQL can simplify query. Now let's expand this example a little bit. Suppose I allow multiple instructors teaching the same class. So instead of one instructor per class section, now I allow a set of instructors for a particular section. Now in this case, our two tables now become three tables. So we'll still have the users table, we'll still have the sections table. However, instead of having a, having a foreign key column in the sections table, now the relationship between users and sections are represented by a third table. And in this table, we can see from this example that uh, for section number one, there's only one instructor CY sum, but for section number two, there are two instructors, CY sum and crispy. Both are teaching section number two. So suppose we still want to find the sections taught by CY sum, or in other words, CY sum is at least one of the instructors. So how do we do that? For the SQL version, it will be something like this. And uh, once again, it's a drawing. So we'll say drawing from sections and from users. And now we'll also have to join with ins instructors and uh, so we'll say s dot id is instructor dot section id and uh, u dot id is instructor instructor id and u dot username username is cy sum and uh, the HQL version would look like this. We'll say select S from section S, join S dot instructors I, where I dot username is CY sum. Yeah, something like this. Okay, so in this example, the HQL version also needs to do a drawing. And uh, 
The syntax for drawing looks a bit weird. It's a section drawing a property of section called instructors. Because instructors is a set, you can actually join with that. And then you can say, just like before, uh, this instructor's username is CYSON. And uh, when we select, we select section objects that meet these requirements. Comparing this one to the SQL one, we can see that this one is still simpler uh, in the sense that uh, here you need to do a three table drawing and here it's a drawing of two sets or yeah, two sets of objects. But uh, nonetheless, it, it does require a drawing and uh, uh, so I want to show this example in case you run into some situation where you have to do a drawing in HQL. Uh, it's not difficult to do, uh, just something like this. If you want, uh, you can also check out the section DAO implementation class in CSNS2. There are more uh, drawing examples in there, but uh, most likely in your homework and project, you won't uh, need to run an inquiry uh, that's more uh, complex than this. OK, to summarize, the, the most important benefit of OIM, in my opinion, is that it allows applications to be designed in true object-oriented manner instead of designing classes that look like tables. And uh, there are also some more practical benefits. In particular, data access with ORM is much simpler and easier because data is accessed as objects. So no manual conversion between objects and rows and, table, uh, and, rows and columns is necessary. Also, JPQL slash HQL queries are usually simpler than SQL queries, and in many cases, we don't even need to write any queries because the ORM tool will automatically generate the queries for us, for example, like in this case. Because of the use of JPA and the, uh, JPQL slash HQL, we can switch to a different database management system fairly easily. And the uh, Last point, which we didn't really get into, is that ORM tools usually do object caching, which is quite beneficial to application performance.